So, good afternoon. I'm Mikael Linden from the CSC in Finland. Can you see my slides? Yes, yeah. we can see them, Mikael. Thank you. So, I'm going to give this presentation together with Yuli. And this is the outline of the webinar. I'll first start by presenting the so to say problem description and then the reverse assurance framework and then you will be continue with single factor authentication and multi-factor authentication profiles and then finally i will um, give ideas how to test it works in an identity provider and potentially give a demo for you and then if better is able to make it he will provide some motivation speak how it um, why it is important for research collaborations so the challenge we want to solve with this assurance suite is here we have an end user from the home university they authenticate at the identity provider that the home university is managing, which then releases the attributes to the service provider via the local federation of the home organization and the service provider, and potentially via Educate Interfederation. The question is, what do we know about the the assurance of the identity assurance assertion the identity provider makes. How was the user initially registered and how was the identity proving done at the home organization when they received the credentials? Is it even possible the credentials are shared by several users? I know there are some universities where the university library has kind of kiosk machine with the user called library user lo always logged in. And that's an example of, of a shared account. It is okay, but we want to be able to flag those users coming from that kind of kiosk machine. Is it possible that later in the future, this user ID will be uh, reassigned or recycled to some other person so that the person behind the user identifier changes over time. If the IDP says the user is a researcher or is a faculty member, how fresh is that information? Is it even possible that the um, user has already departed from the home organization but the account hasn't been deactivated or the affiliation role removed? And how was the user authenticated in the beginning of this session? So these are the issues we want to cover by the assurance suite. So the reverse assurance suite consists of three specifications. The reverse assurance framework, which I will present first, and two authentication profiles, SFA, for single factor authentication and MFA for multi factor authentication. The other profiles have been um, approved in autumn this year, but MFA profile was approved already one year ago. And in this slide, you can also see the URLs um, for that led to more information. So, this is the big picture of assurance in REFETS. We have kind of four categories or components. Identifiers for the properties of the identifiers representing the user. Identity proofing, which describes how the user was registered and the identity proofing was done when they received the credentials for login. Attributes category to describe the freshness of, of attributes. And these three categories consist the, and compose the reverse assurance framework. And then we have the authentication profiles. We have the 
SFA profile for single factor authentication in practice passwords or soft certificates and the MFA profile for multi-factor authentication. And let me first focus on the RAF. And the values that the authenticated user account has in the context of Refats Assurance Framework, they are all described using the EduPerson Assurance attribute that the IDP releases to the service provider. And here's the prefix used in the attribute values. So the first component of RAF presents the properties of the identifiers. And the value ID unique signals that the holder of this account is a single natural person and the credential service provider, which is basically the home organization who has issued this identity, knows how to contact this person, for instance, knows their email address or postal address. And the home organization claims that this user identifier will never be reassigned to another person. And finally, the user identifier is one of the identifiers in the following list. A person unique ID, SAMU two person ID, or subject ID or pairwise ID in the subject identifier attribute specification or if OpenID Connect is used instead of SAML, it's the sub-claim, either public or pairwise. And there's, there are two more extra values in the identifier category, which describe the properties of every person principal name attribute whose reassignment practice is undefined by the every person specification. And now, the RAF value ID no EPPN reassign indicates that this EPPN has the properties one, two, and three above. And the other value ID EPPN reassign one year or one Y means that this the holder of this EPPN value has properties one and two, but the EPPN values can be reassigned by the home organization, but there is a fallow period of at least one year before the EPPN value is circulated to another user. So this was the identifiers component describing the properties of the identifiers. And the next category in the assurance framework is ID proofing which indicates how the user was identity vetted when they received, when they were registered and received the credentials. And this category is basically just an overlay for existing specifications. We have three values for this category. The first one is low, which basically means that the user identity consists of self-asserted um, attributes. So, if the CSP knows they um, are compli compliant with Kantar Assurance Level 1 or IGDF Level Dogwood or Aspen, they know they are also compliant with, with this ID proving level IAP low. The medium value indicates that there's some um, reliability on the identity of the of the user. Basically, it is equal to Kantara Assurance Level 2, or if the CSP complies with Kantara AL2, it complies also with the medium. And the same is the IGTF Level Spurge and Cheddar, and EIDAS Level Low. And the third ID proving component is high. So if the credential service provider 
complies with Kantara Assurance Level 3 or EIDAS Level Substantial. The CSP knows they are compliant with ID proving level high as well. The third category in RAF is the attribute that describes freshness of attributes. And this RAF version 1.0, we focus on one attribute, which is the person affiliation attribute of the user and, and the derived attributes. And some specific values there, which are the um, faculty and member and student values of that attribute. And there are two values in the Rivets Assurance Framework. EPA-1M signals that if the user departs from the home organization, this attribute, every person affiliation attribute value will reflect user's departure within one month, or 31 days at most. And the other value is the same except that the change in the every person assurance is reflected within one day. So the next night when the user leaves, the every person assure affiliation value is, is reflected. So departure in the context of RAF means that the organization and its business, its IT organization reflects the user's departure in the value of the every person affiliation attribute. So it's kind of IT lag after the organization decides that the user no more qualifies to it, to their role. But the decision when a user departs is a business decision in the user's home organization. So it's up to the organization to decide when a person is no more a student or researcher. The Rivets Assurance Framework does not um, impose requirements on those decisions. Finally, for conformance to the Rivets Assurance Framework, itself. There are some criteria which are based on the in common baseline expectations for identity providers. In order to be to be able to assert that the identity provider is compliant with RAF, the identity provider must be operated with organizational level authority and it must be also trusted enough to be used for accessing organization's own systems. Generally accepted security practices must be applied to the IDP and also the federation metadata must be accurate and complete. So those three components present values of every person assurance attributes with IDP can assert independently. And that provides the relying services, the service providers, maximum freedom to make decisions based on the values the IDP releases to them. On the other hand, we know that many service providers also um, appreciate simplicity. And for those service providers, we have coupled a couple of RAF values together to profiles that we have given names cappuccino and espresso. And we think the cappuccino profile is something that should be enough for low risk research use cases based on the analysis the ARC2 and ARC1 project did a couple of years ago. If the users qualifies to idea unique and medium level of ID proofing and affiliation freshness um, one month. The user identity qualifies also to cappuccino level. And that 
is an extra value in reverse assurance framework the IDP releases to a service provider and the service provider can observe only this value if it thinks the cappuccino is enough for their needs and it is proposed to use this cappuccino value together with the SFA profile and the espresso profile is then for more demanding use cases ID proofing must be done in the high level and it is also proposed to use it together with multi-factor authentication so that completes my presentation on the assurance framework and I will now hand it over to Yuli to continue with the SFA. Uh, uh, Mikhail, maybe, may I have a question? This is Petra uh, speaking. Uh, can I have the uh, introduction talk now? That's okay for me if you, if you have landed safely. Yes. Uh, so maybe if you can share the slides that I have prepared. Can you see them now? Um, yes, I can, and I'll just need to ask you to advance them. Um, so the next slide, please. Um, so I do apologize to everybody in the in the webinar today uh, because of the late arrival of the air, aircraft. Uh, unfortunately, I was uh, heavily delayed, um, so I'm still on the way from the airport. Uh, so I I was asked uh, by uh, Licia to um, make a brief uh, non technical introduction into why do we need those uh, assurance profiles. Uh, and uh, from my perspective, I'm uh, coming from a BBMRI, ERIC, which is Biobanking Biomolecular Research uh, Infrastructure, which is the European Research Infrastructure Consortium. And uh, we're one of those uh, international organizations that are providing access to biological material and associated data. Uh, and uh, we are actually very uh, interested in, in the assurance work uh, because, uh, as you will see in the slides, um, we're heavily dependent on knowing uh, with reasonable certainty who the user is, uh, that he has authenticated in a secure way, and uh, that uh, what, what is the affiliation of the user. Next slide, please, Michal. Um, the reason behind this is that the life sciences are guarding access uh, to different kinds of data that are uh, regulated in one, one way or another. It's human data, uh, including partial, uh, particularly sensitive uh, groups of uh, data, such as or categories of the data, such as genetic data, medical records, clinical records. Um, also, some uh, infrastructures are collecting uh, information about uh, the social status uh, of, of people because uh, env environmental exposure of people, which also includes geolocation uh, in time. So all of these things are uh, very sensitive and possibly pretty easily identifying. Uh, there are also some infrastructures within uh, the European research uh, life science infrastructure uh, cluster that are dealing with uh, biological material of uh, national security importance, uh, such as highly pathogenous uh, archives. And uh, again, these are uh, these need to be very certain about uh, who are the users that are accessing uh, their services. Next slide, please. Um, I have taken the example that is closest to BBMRI uh, just to demonstrate uh, how accessing the uh, human biological material and uh, human data uh, is intricate in, in our environment. Uh, so typically, uh, you have some uh, participant, uh, research participant that donates the data to the biobank or to some repository, and they may also donate biological samples. And uh, this is stored in a secure repository. Uh, Typically, such a research participant who may be a patient in a hospital or a donor in some population biobanks. Um, also provides informed consent uh, or some kind of uh, uh, 
description how the material is uh, and the data is intended to be used. I mean, there are now with the uh, with the uh, with the transition to GDPR, uh, there are other ways how you can deal with uh, uh, processing the data, and controlling the data in a legally compliant manner, but. Typically, you're always bound to some purpose why you're collecting the data or why you're collecting the biological material. And uh, that means when somebody tries to access uh, such a repository, uh, first, they need to identify themselves. And second, they typically need to have a kind of project. Uh, typically, in medical research, it's a project that is uh, approved or reviewed by some ethical review boards. Um, and that you only can, as an infrastructure that controls access uh, to uh, such data or material, you can only provide uh, access uh, if the purpose for which the material is going to be processed and the purpose for which it was collected are uh, compatible. Um, of course, uh, when you collect large amounts of materials, uh, you can also try to anonymize it uh, and uh, thereby evade uh, the regulations on processing personal data such as GDPR. But the anonymization typically um, comes with significant costs. Uh, typically it damages the data and there are nice studies showing, uh, for instance, when you use anonymized data uh, for machine learning, that the higher uh, the level of anonymity, uh, the less useful is the result of uh, such machine learning process. There are examples of, uh, for instance, studying a dosage of barfarin, which is for blood dilution. Uh, and uh, they're, they're showing it with increasing uh, privacy of, uh, of patients uh, in, in the machine learning process. Uh, the model is more likely to kill the patients uh, based on uh, the proposed dosage of the, of the warfarin. So um, evading uh, the, the personal data uh, domain by attempting to share it as anonymized data comes with pretty big risks. And for medical research, it's basically advisable to stick to uh, the, the personal data and uh, to um, comply with all the security and the access requirements uh, rather than evading those. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned uh, that uh, the, the access requires uh, first uh, knowing authenticity of the user, uh, identity of the user. Um, and uh, typically it, it requires also some additional information and then it depends uh, case by case uh, what we need. Uh, but uh, what is typically, what, what is quite typical in the life science domain is that the projects are born by institutions, not by individuals. And hence, we typically need uh, to know the affiliation of a person to an institution. Uh, furthermore, uh, we need to know if this has been, uh, this relation has been terminated or not. So we need assurance attribute assurance, Mikhail will probably talk about more in the next slides as well, uh, where attributes are defining <coughs> affiliation of, the, uh, of, uh, of a person to an institution, uh, but we also need a certain freshness so that when somebody is fired because of scientific misconduct, for instance, uh, it's um, clear that they're no longer, uh, or they, their authorization to access uh, certain repositories should be at least re-examined, reviewed. Um, so here uh, we are dependent on the availability of information on attribute assurance and attribute freshness. Um, we need to typically know the real identity of the recipient uh, because the recipient of the data uh, in either paper-based or electronic-based way signs a kind of contract because you can't process personal data without any legal basis. Uh, so that's why we need also a reasonable identity vetting assurance so that we know who is the actual person we're dealing with. And uh, as uh, the controllers of the data or uh, gateways, uh, access gateways. Uh, we also 
need uh, to minimize risks associated with the excess. So we need to minimize risk of unauthorized excess. So it's more due diligence on the provider side, uh, which translates, for instance, into secure enough authentication instances to be used so the, the likelihood of uh, users accounts being stolen stolen is relatively small so hereby we also need uh, authentication instance assurance next slide please so what we see as current practical challenges and uh, why we're very happy that uh, the uh, the work that Mikhail, Mikhail is uh, pioneering uh, in, within the refets or together with the refets group uh, is moving forward and we hope that it's uh, going to be widely adopted uh, is because there are nowadays there are many challenges to this next slide um, typically uh, we have nowadays global identity federations uh, of academic research institutions but on the other hand uh, when you look uh, what is available practically uh, it's a bit constrained because as research infrastructures we have not only users from academia we have also industrial users we have many users coming from hospitals that are not part of these um, academic uh, alliances uh, on, on AI and Second, we typically do not receive sufficient information about assurance uh, through the authentication mechanisms uh, through these, even if the institutions are participating. Um, so uh, basically, uh, in order to improve and streamline the access uh, for the users in the future, we are dependent on these things to materialize because if uh, we're in the situation we are at the moment uh, it's still uh, the, the burden of the user to overcome in order to get access uh, to the human biological material and data is rather high because they need to travel to prove their documents and and so forth and so forth while uh, if the assurance uh, framework is adopted uh, at reasonable scale uh, we, we could get some of this information uh, automatically. Next one. Uh, as you're probably all aware, uh, it's also possible to hook up to commercial identity providers uh, and uh, social IDs such as Google uh, or Gmail uh, ID or, uh, or a Facebook ID. Uh, and some of these are even providing uh, pretty reasonable uh, levels of uh, authentication mechanisms, such as using practically affordable uh, multi-factor authentication. Uh, but there are issues here as well. Uh, even if you accept that uh, you are pushing your users uh, to use those commercial uh, vendor IDs, uh, we are still um, we still don't receive information how the assurance was practically implemented. So uh, you can guess that uh, people who are using Google can use two-factor authentication using their cell phones or using uh, Google Authenticator, but uh, you don't receive the information how the actual authentication instance was done for a particular uh, user. And uh, second, for those social IDs, you have very limited uh, assurance of, uh, of identity of a person because basically anybody can register uh, any name I can register Mikhail Linden's uh, name, if I like, with Google, for instance. So um, that's something uh, that makes it, that again renders this, renders this quite problematic uh, for us. Um, next one. Uh, there is some hope uh, on the, uh, uh, in, in the next, uh, say year or two uh, with the wider adoption of ADAS uh, European ID uh, system systems uh, that should be in place since I think September this year uh, but initial work with uh, 
those governmental providers show that it won't be very easy uh, to get in touch with them because they're very concerned about, for instance, liability when when they would open up uh, their authentication to commercial world uh, if somebody hacks into it, if somebody abuses somebody else's identity, they would become liable also against commercial uh, commercial vendors uh, that are using this for processing payments somewhere, for instance. So they are very reluctant uh, for uh, to collaborate uh, with anybody outside of the governmental sphere where uh, these things can be at least somehow mitigated internally. On the other hand, if we had identity vetting uh, that comes uh, from ADAS uh, and we would receive the assurance information about identity of a person, uh, and if we had multi-factor authentication, for instance, if we link those two things together uh, so that a person would use uh, ADAS for identity vetting and we would receive identity vetting assurance uh, information through ADAS uh, and they would link uh, this account with their Google account and use multi-factor authentication for, uh, for that and they would link it also with their university account uh, so that they uh, so we would receive information on assurance of the attributes that the user is affiliated still affiliated with the university that could be uh, a possible way forward uh, for us uh, so that we could uh, almost instantaneously uh, provide access uh, to at least certain types of uh, sensitive data to, to the users. So with this, I hope that I have at least clarified a little bit uh, why the assurance profiles and the assurance framework is so important and uh, we would like to support this process and uh, stimulate the, the whole ecosystem, at least in, within the research, European research domain, um, so that it gets wide adoption and uh, we as research infrastructures can start relying on it. So thank you very much for your attention. I think the last slide uh, from my end is that when there is a will, there is a way. So let's hope that there is a way. Uh, this all these things can be uh, can be adopted in practice. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Peter, for the motivation. And let's now have a look at the authentication profiles. Um, as Mikhail has shown on his last two slides, um, we've seen that the authentication profiles are decoupled from the assurance framework itself. So, um, but nevertheless, uh, we have a recommendation which authentication profile may go with which values of the Refit assurance framework. For low-risk use cases, we recommend to use the single-factor profile, uh, which I'm going to present uh, here first. So the SFA profile is asserted by using the URL shown on the slide, and it is expressed by a credential service provider either um, in the SAML authentication context class reference or the OIDC ACR claim. Next slide, please, Mikhail. Um, and what are the requirements of the SFA profile? So in general, uh, the SFA profile distinguishes between two main criteria. On the one hand, we have the requirements for the factor itself, and on the other hand, we have the requirements for the replacement of a lost authentication factor. Um, let's start with the first one. So the requirements for the factor itself are further divided into four criteria. And what we see here on the slide um, is one of these criteria. And this criteria here shown on the slide um, deals with the different authentication types and the minimum secret length based on the given uh, secret basis. So important to know at this place is that uh, these quantitative values are minimum requirements and a credential service provider can always um, have stricter policies. And uh, this also applies for all of the other requirements. But uh, let's now have a closer look at the table. Um, what we see here are four different kinds of authentication types, um, which are derived uh, from the NIST 863.3 document. Uh, 
And for each of the authentication types, we have uh, defined some secret bases and a corresponding uh, minimum length. What does that mean? So for example, in the row one, for memorized secrets, which are for example passwords, uh, we have defined two secret bases. If the user can choose his her, or her password, for example, out of a set greater or equal than 52 characters, um, the pass, uh, password must be at least uh, 12 characters in length. Um, if the user uh, can choose um, the password out of uh, 72 characters or greater, it is sufficient to have a password with eight characters, for example. We also provide uh, two appendices where examples for the authentication types and example passwords are provided. And the other rows um, on uh, at this table are handled analogously. Next slide, please, Mikhail. So we have another three criteria dealing with the authentication factor itself. What we can see um, on the left slide, uh, side at the table is the maximum lifetime of the secrets in case they are, they are transmitted. Um, we have defined different lifetimes um, depending on the way of delivery. For example, if an SMS is used, the secret lifetime uh, must not exceed um, 10 minutes. On the right hand side, we have uh, we see two criteria covering uh, threat protection. Um, these are quite high level criteria to allow their credential service providers some freedom um, of action in order to deal with them. So the first one here is uh, that there have to be some kind of um, protection against online guessing in place, like for example, by doing rate, some rate limiting. Um, and the second one is that the secrets have to be cryptographically protected, addressed, as well as in online transit. Next slide, please. So uh, the criteria I have presented at the last two slides have dealt with the requirements of the factor itself. And as mentioned at the beginning, um, the SFA profile also defines requirements for the replacement of the lost authentication factor, which are shown uh, on this slide. For example, it is not allowed uh, to send existing stored secrets to the user. Um, I do not um, go through all of, the, um, all of them in detail now, uh, but the other ones determine, for example, how to deal with human-based procedures or also um, yeah, how to deal with backup authenticators. Next slide, please, Mikhail. Okay, um, I would now pass over to the multi-factor authentication profile, um, as I think we have um, time for questions uh, right after the presentation. So the MFA profile, as mentioned before, has already been approved in June uh, 2017, um, but for sake of uh, completeness, we will also have a quick look at this profile, which is part of the Refit's Assurance Suite as well. And it is expressed uh, the same way as the SFA profile. Next slide, please. So uh, basically, the MFA profile is an interoperability profile, including three high-level criteria. Um, this profile is rec recommended for high-risk use cases that uh, does not and it does not depend, uh, depend on the SFA profile. So that means you do not have to qualify to the criteria of the SFA profile first in order to assert the MFA profile. So the SFA profile and the MFA profile are independent of each other. Let's now have a look at the criteria. The first one uh, states that two different factors have to be used. Um, and it is, for example, not allowed to use two different passwords. The second one uh, states that the factors have to be independent. And the th uh, third one, that a single factor um, only risks must be mitigated by uh, the combination of uh, these factors. Uh, we have also piloted these profiles, so the Refit Assurance Framework, the single factor um, authentication profile, and the MFA profile. And I will now hand over to Mikhail again, uh, who will tell us something about configuring and testing the IDPs. Thank you. Thank you, Yuli. 
So we did a pilot in spring and documented some practices um, how to configure the SAML providers for this Refetz Assurance Suite. Um, it is mostly about how to configure the identity provider to follow the um, Assurance Suite because most of the configuration and also most of the requirements of the backend system and processes are actual requirements for the IDPs. For the service provider, it's relatively easy. They just need to request certain authentication context from the IDP and observe the resulting authentication context and the EduPerson assurance attribute values if they, if they meet the service provider's needs. In the pilot, most of the IDP products used were Shivath IDP identity providers, and in the Rivets Wiki, you can find um, example configuration for SHIB IDP. For simple SAML PHP, we didn't have that wide coverage. We had one of the simple SAML PHP um, based service providers in the pilot, which was actually a proxy. IDP proxy, which was also acting as an IDP for their constituency. But my message here is, if you are managing a simple SAML PHP based IDP, please contribute your findings on configurations to the Refetz Fiki. For third popular SAML implementation, which is Microsoft ADFS, we found that it is possible to configure it to use the Refresh Assurance Framework because it is basically just an extra attribute, a person at Assurance attribute that needs to be populated for the, for the accounts in the ADFS IDP. But the authentication profiles are difficult and currently not supported because they require custom authentication context classes. If you have an IDP and you want to test how it um, how it technically conforms with the Refresh Assurance Suite, I propose you use the switch attribute view service whose URL is up there. It will display, it will allow, if your IDP is in Edugain, it will allow you to use your IDP to log into the attribute view and then it displays the assurance attributes and authentication contexts. But actually, I have planned to give a demo, a live demo using my home organization IDP. So let's see if we will eventually get a demo effect. So I select my home organization which is CSC. And log in at my home organization IDP using my ordinary password. And now I'm redirected back to the attribute viewer. Here are the attributes my home organization IDP did release on me. And here are the assurance related attributes, which represent the values in the reverse assurance framework. So you can see it's a multi valued attribute, a person assurance that my home organization released. And there are values for the ID component, EPP, and are not reassigned and the EBPNs are unique. And for the identity assurance, medium, high, and low, they are all supported. So an identity proved face to face when I started at CSC a long time ago. And CSC also confirms that the day after I depart from CSC, my account is closed or at least my edu person affiliation value is updated to reflect my departure. 
And CSC complies to both cappuccino and espresso um, profiles. In this example, I didn't, well, the service provider didn't request any particular authentication context, so the IDP delivered what is the shibboleth um, default. But there's also a nice extra button here in this switch attribute view. I can click request logging with MFA and this service provider issues a new authentication request to my IDP with MFA as required. So I click here. I'm redirected back to my IDP, to my home organization IDP, where I authenticate first using my first authentication factor, which is the password. And then I'm redirected to the Hakka Federation multi-factor authentication service, which uses TOTP standard as the second authentication factor. And I open my smartphone and I have my TOTP client, which is um, Google Authenticator in my case, in my smartphone. And I type in the one time password it gives. And here I am back in the service provider. It provides exactly the same edu person assurance attribute values. But now it delivers the authentication context class requires to refetch MFA. And this attribute weaver, by the way, also manages a list of IDPs who have ever exposed the authentication contexts to this um, attribute view. So that was the demo. And um, my final slide is here. So you saw what the refits assurance suite covers. Here are couple of bullet points what it does not cover. So there is nothing in a SAML2 metadata related to the Refits Assurance Framework or SFA MFA. So technically everything takes place between the IDP and SP directly. That means that there are no technical requirements for federation operator in SAML2 metadata management system. So basically, adoption requires no technical steps for federation operator, but of course, we still expect and hope that the federation operators are able and willing to spread the word on refits assurance suite to the identity providers and, and service providers as well. The assurance suite doesn't define conformance program. So these um, RAF and SFA MFA assertions are based on self-assessment that the CSP does if, if they comply with the requirements. There is this switch attribute view service that can be used for testing technical conformance, however. So that's it. Any questions? Yes, Paul Axis and Sunatir has one. Uh, you showed when you did your demo uh, 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 that even though you didn't do a multi factor authentication, uh, you expressed uh, express, uh, your IDP d expressed the expresso value to the service provider. Uh, will that be uh, an interesting discussion? around if some think it's been done or some uh, or not. So the espresso requires only those certain values of those 
reverse assurance framework components. It, it doesn't imply anything about how the authentication was done. So it's fully compliant with reverse assurance framework that the IDP asserts Espresso, uh, even although the user is authenticated using SFA or password protected transport. Yeah, it is important to um, know that um, the authentication profiles, as mentioned, are decoupled from the uh, Refit Assurance Framework. And these assurance profiles, uh, Cappuccino and Espresso, only um, cover um, more or less the um, uh, RIF values. Thanks. Any other questions? <clears throat> Michael, this is Lita speaking. I have a question, actually. Um, I mean, we are uh, working on two directions to promote uh, RAF and the assurance adoption, both, let's say, on the ARC side with the research communities, uh, define the profiles for them to consume assurance, basically, and to assert also assurance as a service provider towards the proxies. So that's a different conversation in both, uh, let's say, in refets. What do you think? I mean, it is a bit mo difficult to monitor the uptake uh, because, you know, we cannot really check each uh, individual IDP. What do you think we could do as a community, as for instance, Refet or Geant or ARC or, you know, any of these, to make sure that uh, uh, IDPs buy in? Uh, I, I have no idea. Is there anything that we can make it clear that is not too difficult, that the liability is, is covered? That I don't know. Is there anything? Yes, this is certainly how to promote this assurance to, it, to the community, to the IDPs and SPs is certainly something the community needs to discuss and plan together. I believe the uh, gateway to the IDPs are the federation operators. So the federation operators, even although this doesn't impose technical requirements to federation operators, the federation operators are still in the control of the channel, kind of communications channel to the IDPs. They can spread the word in the local events and somehow couple it to the local federation policies and any assurance frameworks they may have in place for the local federation. They can also give the presentation in the local languages, which may be easier for, for the IDPs adoption. But the federation operators are key um, actors in the value chain. For service providers, well, currently it is supposed that research-related service providers are the key customers. And in, in that sense, research communities, research infrastructures are probably in the position to spread the word towards the service providers and speak about Refet's assurance framework in those events where the, where the service providers um, are in, included. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. I was hoping you had some <clears throat> magic trick that we could deploy, but um, yeah. So I guess keep pressuring federation operators in some ways. Any other questions? So thank you from my side. Do you, Nicole or Alicia, want to give some final words? Um, I have nothing else to say except thank you very much to you, Mikhail, and, and to you, Leigh, and to Peter for um, a really well prepared and um, excellently presented presentation. Um, the recording will be placed online um, and hopefully 
we can use that to also help disseminate and encourage people to participate. Um, so thanks to the three of you very much and thanks to everyone who participated and joined us today. <laughs>